we always knew because just at sundown we'd hear his drum start and wake up in the middle of the night we could hear his drum still going all night until just the first tinge of light as is when it, the light gets to the point where you begin to can see some definition of things that's before the raven cries then he would he would stop but so all the healing would begin with a song. Everything is harmony, everything is a song. And Nishla, or healing, begins when I realize some sicknesses are caused by my own illness. Gungusti'i. Stop being sick, you're making yourself sick. Sometimes I start imagining that there's something wrong with me. And it gets worse when I'm trying to make it stop because I'm focusing on something that isn't, isn't real. I'm manufacturing. Uh, there's a doctor, something, Kapoor, oh, what's his name? Anyway, he's written a bunch of books on addictions and stuff. And he was talking about some similar things and I told him I was really happy to hear him talk about those things because those are the things I was being taught. And this was at a big conference thing. He said, I want to interview you for my next book. <laughs> so, but these are the things that he was talking about, too. Is that, well, I guess it's called psychosomatic when you create your own illness. And also, a part of it is, if you're, if you're injured, sometimes people will die from a minor injury and other people survive a horrible injury but what it is I think is the person's mind focuses on the injury and it begins to magnify and they go into shock and it kills them so something I learned in the military was sometimes get get that person out of their head uh, I was waiting for a train in Waukegan, Illinois. I was going to Chicago. And a guy leaned on a pinball machine, I think it was, with a glass top, and it broke. And his hand went through and cut his, gashed his arm, and he was really bleeding. And so he was either yelling and whatever, and the guy took off his belt and said, put a tourniquet on him. I said, get the hell away from him. He's not hurt that bad. Give me that. So I grabbed the hole of where the wound was and I squeezed and I said, I said, now sit down. You're not hurt that bad. What the hell's the matter with you yelling like that? You're scaring everybody. <laughs> I was scared myself. And the guy said, you put a tourniquet on him, you probably lose, cause him to, to lose his arm because you cut off the flow of blood. It, does more damage than good, so leave him alone. Somebody get an ambulance, because I'm not, I don't have anything to show him up. And I was just running off with him up because I was scared, but I had sense enough to not let him focus on how bad he was injured. And they came and got him, and then I was just shaking like this. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing happened on the ship I was on. We were my battle station was what they call after radar. And there was a 500 pound concussion door that when it was sealed, it was watertight. And it's called condition zebra. It's when it would make the whole ship watertight. And so the guns were firing. And I saw the matches we call dogs. I seen them turn. Somebody was opening the door. And my phone talker, uh, Seaman, was crouched a little ways away from me. And I told him, call combat information or damage control and find out who's breaking condition zebra to get into our space. And then the door opened, and this radio man stepped through the door, and the thing weighs 500 pounds, this door. And he grabbed a hold of it this way, the edge of it, and it's closed this way. And just when he started to step through, the, we'll call it Claxton, I guess, this warning from the big guns. Zip, zip. When they fired, 
the whole ship would go sideways. 21,000 ton ship and that door slammed and it cut one of his fingers completely off and pretty well mangled his hand. And he looked at it and he just fell and he kind of twisted up and his head was hanging out the door. And I was sitting down and he looked at his hand like that and he just started, you know, he just yelling and whatever. And I don't know how I did it, but I heard that thing go bzzz. I knew I had to, I got about two seconds. Somehow or other, I got up on my feet. I reached down, I grabbed him by the hair, with this hand here, and I pulled him in like that, just as the gun fired again. And that door came around again, and I put the latch on it, and then he was flailing around there, so I threw him down, and I got a hold of him to control the breathing. And my phone talk was kneeling there, right? He kept saying he had this helmet on and his earphones, and did he hurt his hand? Did he hurt his hand? And he was going into shock. So I just let go enough to reach over and punch him. Didn't hit him very hard, but it was just enough to shock him because I was yelling at him and he'd get a corner. And so he called for help and then I held this guy down and kept going. Geez, you're making it worse. You kept the whole damn space bloody here. Just hold still, let me hear in a minute. He said, how bad is it? I said, probably about as bad as having a broken heart. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. You know? like, that's all I could think of to say. And they came and got him and took him out. And um, they took him away from the ship. And I never saw the guy again. But um, the same deal, it started shaking. I guess it's the adrenaline. So it could have been much worse if I said, oh, God, that's, you know, then his mind would make it really just explode and probably not, he could have died from that, you know, from shock. So that's the same principle here in Haida. Come goes to E, stop being sick, you're making yourself sick. Um, I'm very sensitive to smell. Sometimes I smell something and it triggers reaction from some memory somewhere and then I have to tell myself, oh, wait a minute, this is now, it ain't back there, this is what I'm... So then another one is, Nisla, uh, uh, or healing, begins with acknowledging one's illness. We cannot fix something whose existence we deny. Um, I guess with my stroke, I kept telling myself it wasn't really a stroke. This is just something went haywire, but it's going to be okay. And uh, until my uncle came to see me, and that's when he told me this about instead of asking me to be restored, just ask him, my spirit calls, take a look, see what I need. And leave it at that and go about your life trying to fix what you can. And uh, that's when I, I realized that I really had had a stroke. It wasn't just some mishap of anything. So until I could acknowledge that, then there was, you can't fix it if you won't acknowledge it. But some people immediately see something as a death sentence, and that's just as bad. Um, and also, Nisla, water is the first medicine. If you have a headache, drink water. If you have a stomach ache, drink water. And on the lighter side, if you have a broken heart, drink lots of water. That way you can cry longer. <laughs> but so every morning, what I do to acknowledge this medicine is I wash my face with cold water, no soap, just, just water. And if my skin is greasy or something, I'll use a little bit of soap. 
for using soap takes the oil out of your skin and that's where wrinkles come. But don't worry, wrinkles don't hurt. Um, Nisla healing begins with a sincere desire to be well. There's some people don't really want to be well. They'll find reasons to be to get disability or something. Even when well, I pull the Achilles tendon, I guess it's called in my on my ankle, and I was on crutches. We were filming a movie called White Fang 2, and one of the uh, elders who was an actor on there was, uh, um, what's his name, Pahri, Pahri, uh, Charles Natcom. When he saw me with those crutches, he said, what are you doing with those sympathy sticks? <laughs> so I didn't get a chance to feel sorry for myself. <laughs> so they would do things like that to keep you from focusing on something that's wrong. Of course it was painful and I had trouble going up and down steps but I was bound and determined it's going to be okay when he said that to me. <laughs> and then Nisla begins with diagnosis from another. I can't doctor myself, I can't tickle myself, I can't name myself and I've told you the first one is I can't lick my own elbow. The first time I heard it, I waited till nobody's looking. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everybody does that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we don't name ourselves because we don't, we can't really step out of ourselves and examine what what my temperament is, what my personality is. And also, um, I try to diagnose myself. I know I've got a headache, so this must be. Well, there's so many different possibilities with what a headache is causes a headache. Um, <clears throat> so it has to be somebody who can see the whole person rather than just that one one symptom or two. And Nisla begins with having a soft mind. Um, this one I have to edit, but anyway, it says, nothing is ever made with only one side. I am part of another person's healing. So some people will have physical problem, an illness, but not tell anybody. And so they don't get that support. If someone is very sick or having a very difficult time, what we say to them, Ti kudumai tlatska. Ti kudumai tlatska. A rough translation is, my mind is strong for you because you're standing in that place. In other words, it's my total being is focused on support. You have my unconditional support. And so when we tell somebody that, and you get that from people telling you, you know, once you've told them that you, you have this problem, and people are coming and telling you they, you have their support then it triggers something inside you that will actually start a healing process. It may not reach fruition, but you don't feel alone, and being alone is what kills people. So that soft mind too is when you care about what another person is feeling. Uh, so, if you recognize, I mean, you do have a problem. It's different when some people come up to you and tell you all their ailments and all their problems. That's different from somebody who's facing, we'll say, a life-threatening uh, illness or something that can be life-altering. Uh, Nisla begins with the realization that I'm never alone. Western society keeps making us feel alone. The social services part of it, I've told people I work with, that when a young person is taken into foster care, there's a thing called aging out. 
They go through a process of where they're being taught independent living. And then when they reach, I guess it's age 19, they're cut loose. Now their relationship is severed. And to my way of thinking, and what this indicates, is that's an aberration. That should never happen. That what we need to do really instead is to take that young person and start helping them fit into another um, support system so that they're never alone. It says that when I'm born, the reincarnated spirit of another person comes with me. And all during my life, that reincarnated spirit will be with me. And when I leave to go home, that reincarnated spirit will go with me. So I'm never alone. All those plants out there, those are my relatives. Those trees are my grandmothers. If I'm hurting, I'm feeling very bad, I can go to any tree and say, Grandmother, I'm having a hard time. And she'll comfort me. If I'm feeling fear, I go to any one of those trees and put my spine against the tree and say, Nana, I'm afraid. Grandmother, I'm afraid. And she'll embrace me. Another one that this old one's told us is that when a child was first born, it used to be they would take that baby out on a moonless night, clear sky, and hold it up to the sky and tell it those are all your relatives and will tell those star beings, this is your grandchild, look out for them. And so when you start feeling small, like the world's pressing you down, you can look up there and say, that's all my relatives. Now I'm as big as anything. Never make yourself feel small. So we always have those things. And even our term for somebody, even though, say you're from the Raven side, and I called you Tui. Tui is my relative, but not really. What it means is that we're so closely related that we can joke with each other real hard and we can't get mad. So it's a close relationship without being real relatives. So, um, so once you can feel that when people say right there they're telling you you're not alone I was working with a young lady as part of my job as, as a, it's called a family support elder I was talking to a young lady who was pregnant in a woman's hospital and she's trying to make her life drug free, alcohol free and, and uh, tranquilizer free and I asked her where her family was from and she told me and I said I know people from there you're not alone and she started to cry and we went back in the hospital and um, the social worker from the hospital said to her you're late for your drug and alcohol class something like that and she said, we were talking about something important. And that social worker said, your program's important. And she said, I'm not alone. And in one of our classes too, we had a, at the end of the 11 weeks, well, it was 14 weeks then, we asked people, what did you get from this? And there was a 10 year old boy in here and he says, I'm not alone. <laughs> so that's a very, very important part of healing is to know that you're never alone. And also healing begins with taking back your power. This is where your spirit house is, it's right in here. Not your heart, your kook is just a thing that works in there. Well, your feelings really come from the brain, but when you get excited about something, you don't feel your brain jumping around, getting all excited, but you feel it in here. And so, <clears throat> when 
see get done. I never experienced that more than 10 or 15 times. Well, it feels empty here and it hurts. That means you gave up your power. So push it out and take it back. And then when you're dealing with the medicines that confuse drugs and alcohol, that one's called Daniel's Town Line. That's the spirit or medicine of confusion. And when that one comes in, and it pushes your spirit out. And it's said that when a child is born, that its spirit is only very loosely attached and can leave at any time. So that child should never be out of the sound of another human heartbeat. It should never be put in a room by itself. There are many people who, so that they can get a sketch sleep, they'll put a monitor so they can hear the child but the child can't hear them, can't hear their heartbeat. And so my way of thinking, maybe that's what this sudden death, infant death syndrome is, is it can attach to something so it leaves. Well, it's the same way when drug and alcohol addiction takes control, is your spirit is only very loosely attached because it's pushed it out. And the only way you can get rid of that thing is you have to push it out. Then once you push it out, Others, people in my class, they can give you that support that helps you hold it out. So that's what I mean by taking back your power. But even like a man named Percy Frisbee was a chief executive officer, the executive officer of Hyde Corporation, the CEO, and I was his assistant. And his grandfather was one of my teachers. And I heard him tell somebody one day that his grandfather, Chana, said, we hide us, don't bow to any, anyone or anything. And what he was referring to was we were working with lots of Japanese. And somebody advised him that he was supposed to bow to him. Well, that was the wrong word. Because what he was, what his grandfather had said, and what the other ones had said, is that I live my life in such a way that I never say I'm better than whomever or whatever, or I'm just as good as. I live my life knowing that nobody's better than me. I don't have to prove it. But if I say, I'm just as good, well, I'm going to try to prove it. Or if I'm better than, I'm going to have to try to prove it. But the other way, I hold my ground and hold my place. And so there's a difference between bowing and yielding your personal sovereignty to something or somebody else. It's the other thing is to acknowledge someone who's treating you with respect or showing respect to you. So that's a different thing when you acknowledge it rather than bowing your head. And that's what came from King James, of bowing your head to the king. Because they learned if you don't bow to the king, you could cut your head off. So it's about fear rather than respect. It's fear. Whereas in ours, it was taught by behavior, how you behave, not by, by words. And uh, in East Law, healing begins when you get out of your head. When you're happy, you stop thinking about yourself and your body can begin healing itself. So, there was always a lot of laughter at home. My dad sometimes would do stuff that all of us would just have to laugh. Uh, and instead of yelling at us he would show his embarrassment by just saying oh and then he'd walk off <laughs> but he didn't get mad or, i mean he was even tempered always mad at least i thought he was but it was me because he didn't understand english i mean he didn't think that way so he would say something to me and i would think he's criticizing me and i would get angry 
And then when I was in my 50s, close to 60, Dad said something, and I thought to myself, he's trying to joke with me. So I said something joking to him, and we got on just fine for the rest of his life. Because I was so narrow in my thinking, I was so focused on me and against them. Uh, and so once I can get out of my head and stop thinking about